Very generous man, the hard working preacher is giving his first sermon for the for the feast. That's that's interesting. You could bring the fan a little closer. Brethren, the last great day is the a kind of day of sadness because we we have to break this joyous celebration. We go home. And for those who have been keeping the feast for many years, like me, there is a stark realization that it is very likely that some of you will not return. Some of you will not make it back. That has been the history. Because as we go back home, there are so many snares, there are so many serpents in the wilderness, that every year, the snares and the serpents claim victims. What can you do to ensure that you make it back to the Feast of Tabernacles? I not only remember members who did not make it back, but sadly, some of my most memorable last day sermons were given by people who did not make it back. As my family and I sat and dined in the salubrious environment of Evita's, my big daughter recalled a sermon given some years ago on the last great day. Remember to remember. The person who gave that sermon did not remember to remember. I remember another sermon also given on the last day. Comparing the Feast of Tabernacles to those pit stops where you get refreshed for the journey. I wouldn't want to tell you where he is in his journey now. He's not returned. I remember an electrifying sermon given on the last great day, a highly motivational sermon, where the speaker, with such brilliance and eloquence, began to quote extemporaneously from a variety of motivational speakers, the best in the world, one of the, the greatest flights of rhetorical elegance I've ever heard. He never returned. I've been in the church a long time. Some of the finest ministers we had. Men like Albert J. Portune, a David John Hill, eventually fell out of the truth. There were men who were powerful preachers, powerful speakers. They never continued. I believe that there is a book in the Bible particularly that has certain key lessons that if we learn those lessons it can help us to return today I want to take you to the work of the weeping prophet the prophet Jeremiah and in his lamentations he mourns the state of Israel when we look at the church of God today, the parlous state that we are in as a church, the pathetic state of the church of God, I recall the desolation that Jeremiah prophesied. And that spiritual desolation is upon us in the church of God. I call on the church of God to heed the warnings of the prophet Jeremiah to repent. The book of Jeremiah is filled with warnings about the effects of sin, the corrosive effects of sin as we go home. Whether we're here for the one day, 
visit or we have been here for the entire days. I want us to heed the lessons from the weeping prophet. He laments in Lamentations 1 and verse 1. How lonely sits the city that was full of people. I'm sure some of my American brethren here would remember the great days when we had thousands and thousands at Wisconsin Dells. We had thousands at Jekyll Island. We had thousands at St. Petersburg. There were so many people at Big Sandy. The work of God had grown to such great heights. The voices of the Armstrongs were heard all over the United States, in many parts of South Africa and Australia, certainly in Jamaica. In Jamaica, the Armstrongs were a household name. Today, how lonely sits the Church of God. Most congregations, average size is probably in the 20s. How like a widow has she become? She who was great among the nations. When, when we were putting out at one time, there were about 26 million people reading the Plain Truth magazine. The World Tomorrow broadcast at, at, at Blanket in place like Canada. You could not escape the World Tomorrow. But sin brought down the church of God, the worldwide church. And I come to warn the church of God today not to make the mistakes of our forefathers. Verse 4, the roads to Zion mourn, for none comes to the festival. All our gates are desolate. This is talking about the Babylonian invasion, the Babylonian desecration. Church of God, I come and I say, as you go home, as you go home, there are things to do. There are things that we learn from the book of Jeremiah and from the life of Jeremiah that are key solitary things. One, one of the biggest things that have caused many to fall away is the corruption in the church, the corruption among the leadership, sins in the lives of the brethren. The sins in the lives of the brethren have caused more people to go astray. We have become our greatest enemies. We have become stumbling blocks. I urge you, brethren, I urge you not to allow the sins of your brethren to keep you from your faithfulness to God. Turn to Jeremiah 23 to see how bad things were. And what is significant about the book of Jeremiah is that he shows that it was the priests and the prophets who were the leaders in sin. The priests and the prophets were corrupt. They were liars. They were adulterers. They were seducers. And when you have a leadership that is corrupt, it is very hard for members to maintain their focus. I want to say to the Church of God in Canada, in the United States, in various parts of Jamaica, I want to say do not make the mistakes that were made by those in Jeremiah's time. I want you to follow the example of Jeremiah who lived in the midst of a corrupt people and yet he maintained his zeal. It is not easy to maintain your zeal when you are with so many people who are sinning, who are rejecting God. It is hard. That is why we need to get into these books. We need to get into the Bible. Because we see these things are written down for our example. Jeremiah 23, 
Woe to the shepherds who destroy and scatter the sheep of my pastor. These were not talking about false ministers. These were not talking about false churches. These were God's shepherds who had betrayed their responsibilities. This is not talking about people who are not in the true church. This is a message to the, to the shepherds of God. You have scattered my flock. You have driven them away. And how? Because the lives. We were looking to the ministers for examples. We found that many of them were hypocrites. Many of them did not follow what they taught us. But what is our response? Verse 9 concerning the prophets. Here, here is Jeremiah talking. My heart is broken within me. All my bones shake. I am like a drunken man. Why? Because the land is full of adulterers. The land is full of adulterers. And the priests were among them. Brethren, when you look at the last day church, when you look at the churches in the book of Revelation, and you, you see the messages to the churches, you see that they were not doing very well. God had something against almost all of them. Jesus predicted that the love of many, because iniquity would increase, the love of many would wax cold. Yes. What that means is, you had better watch yourself. The church environment affects you. And because of the corruption in the church, some of you have lost your zeal. The Lord has asked me to speak to my American Canadian brethren, to everyone. I know the disappointments you have gone through. I remember in 1977 when I read a book written by a former minister. I was so shocked about the things that he revealed. I could not sleep on that Monday night. I could not believe it. But of course, when I attended my very first service in 1974, Time magazine had come out with an article entitled Trouble in the Empire which reported on the major split that we had in 74 when 2,000 members left and people like Al Caruso, Ernest Martin and others led a group away from the church. I had to determine then, I had to determine whether because the leaders who taught me the truth were corrupt, I was going to go and join a church that was not teaching the gospel. I had a choice. I could go to a church that had righteous people and people who are living morally well, but who did not understand the gospel. Or I could stay in the midst of the corrupt people who have the gospel and try to be a light and try to be different and fulfill my call. I had a choice and many persons have taken the choice to join the churches of the world because they are more spiritual according to them. I draw your example to Jeremiah. Go to Jeremiah 9. Jeremiah was faced with this thing. As I have my American Canadian brethren before me. Others of you in the church of God because the internet knows through the internet. There is nothing hidden. No matter where you are in the world now, you can Google the names of our founders and the things that you will find. You won't want to have anything to do with the gospel. You have a choice. It was a choice that faced Jeremiah. Jeremiah, here, here was the case. 
There was no prophecy, no prophet for 80 years before God called Jeremiah who came from a priestly class. Jeremiah was called during the reign of Josiah who in his eighth year of reign, he, he began reigning when he was eight years old, his eighth year of reign, he began to restore the truth and to throw the Assyrian gods and the Assyrian culture. Before him was one of the worst kings that Israel ever had, a man called Manasseh. He did more evil than all the kings combined. When God called Jeremiah, some say he was about 13 years, others 20, a young man. The people had been in a sorry spiritual state. And God had not sent a prophet since Isaiah. 80 years no prophet had spoken. That had taken its toll on the people spiritually. They were lukewarm, they were sinful, they were awful. It was an awful people to be among. They were, they were wretched. They were doing all kinds of abominations. In Jeremiah 9, in verse 1, Jeremiah cries out, Oh, that my head were waters and my eyes a fountain of tears, that I might weep day and night for the slain of the daughter of my people. Oh, that I had a desert, a traveler's lodging place, that I might leave my people. Jeremiah was so fed up with the people, he wanted to leave. He wanted to run away. He could not stand the stench of the corruption of the sin. But what did he do? He resisted that human urge. It is not an urge from God to leave the people of God because of their sinfulness. I make a bold statement. I make a very bold statement. I say that it is not justifiable to walk away from the people with the gospel with the deposit of faith because of their sinfulness and the sinfulness of their leaders Jeremiah 9 and verse 2 hold that I had I had in the desert a traveler's lodging place that I might leave my people and go away from them for they are all adulterers, including the pastors, the priests. They're a company of treacherous men. They bend their tongue like the bow. Falsehood and not truth has grown in the land. They proceed from evil to evil. How many of you here have the nerve to be among a people like that and not leave? How many of you can be in a congregation? Corruption is taking place on the top. And you leave. Verse 3, they bend their tongue like a bow. Falsehoods and not truth has grown strong in the land. Look at verse 4. This was God's people. What an awful indictment. Jeremiah 9, 4. Let every man beware of his neighbor. Put no trust. Can you imagine being a congregation where you have to be? You can't trust anybody. Everybody's a liar. Everybody's out to get you. Who would want to stay? Jeremiah refused to leave for 40 years. He preached among his people. He was faithful to the commission that God gave him. Despite the sinfulness of the people. And despite the corruption of the priesthood and the prophets. Say to the church of God. Faced with this very test in the last days. Some of the finest ministers I know have become so disillusioned. They have become so dispirited because of the corruption. 
I've read some heart-rending stories of sincere men who went to Ambassador College saying, well, this was God's college. They saw so much corruption at Ambassador College. They saw so much oppression. They saw blatant hypocrisy. They left, many of them are now atheists. I was reading one anti-Church of God site last night. One man, he was working at headquarters and he said, you know, when I left the church in 1975, I just went out partying, partied for a long time. It is hard. Verse 5 says, everyone deceives his neighbor. No one speaks the truth. They have taught their tongue to speak lies. Jeremiah remained, carried out his warning against them. For you to survive <laughs> among church people, you have to be strong. Church people are the hardest people to deal with, the most difficult you find people in the world far easier, seemingly far godlier than church people. If you can survive church people, you can make it in the kingdom. They are hard to survive. That's going to be your biggest test. Your biggest test is going to be church people. That's your biggest obstacle. Many of our brethren have not survived. Many of our brethren gave up jobs for the truth. They gave up their own sick, their own families for the truth. They gave up their health for the truth. And what finally hit them was a disillusionment with the leaders. When Satan tried everything else, and he put before them the people whom they had on the pedestal. When I found out thing about my spiritual father, Mr. Herbert Armstrong, he was so amazing. In the earlier years, I thought the problem was with Ted Armstrong, and later I realized that with, with Herbert it was, was even worse. Why have I stayed? I have stayed because I cannot find the gospel anywhere else. I have stayed because I, I have seen Jeremiah as a model. Jeremiah in the midst of a crooked people. Holding on to the truth. Separating the truth from the sinfulness of people's lives. Jeremiah believed God that God would set it right. Jeremiah did not believe in taking things into his own hands. So many have done that. I am sorry Al Portune left and Al Carosa left. I'm sorry Gary Avidsen left. And all these fine leaders, David John Hill. We lost so many great men. Dr. Robert Kuhn, Professor Lester Graby, so many. Because when they came face to face with the problems, they go to Jeremiah 5. Let's see how bad it really is. It was then. Jeremiah 5 and verse 1. Jeremiah 5 and verse 1. Run to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem. Look and take note. Search the squares to see. Listen to this. Listen to this. If you find a man, anyone who does justice and seeks truth, that I may pardon her. Things were so bad. You talk about Sodom, where you couldn't find five. Could not find one. It was so bad. How many of you here could have survived that? You would have gone back to the Assyrian gods. You would have sought the Babylonian gods. You would have inquired about the Egyptian gods because you would say, surely Yahweh has no power to keep his people. How many could be a Jeremiah? Search, Yahweh says, if you can find him, but I spare the place. It was so bad. To 
come back next year, you have to have the stomach, the spiritual stomach for the sinfulness of God's people. You have to prepare your mind for the worst. What we have in the church of God now is more splintering and people going off all over the place. We have forgotten about the great mission that we have to bring in new people the truth. Because we have been sidetracked. The corruption was that bad. And what was the problem, you see? And it's the same problem we had in the worldwide church of God. Remember, Josiah had started the reforms. Kings and Chronicles tell us they found the book of the law and Josiah reinstituted the feast days, tore down the Asherah, brought back worship, true worship. And just like the worldwide church of God, we had the true worship, we had the Sabbath, we had the truths that God gave to Mr. Armstrong. But we did not have the moral life. So Josiah had his reforms and you would think that things were well because certainly they have moved away from the Assyrian gods that dominated. But it was a form of religion that they denied with godliness. It was a superficial religion. When you read Jeremiah, you saw that they didn't deal with the poor right. They didn't deal with the widow's right. Pure religion is to deal with people and people's needs. Pure religion is to help, is to be compassionate, not just to keep Sabbath and feast days. You had a people that were more interested in the form of religion rather than the substance. That's a problem in the church of God. We are awful husbands, but good holiday keepers. Awful husbands. Our wives hate when we are at home. We are a terror in the house, but, but we are lovely in jacket at church. We are awful employers. We rob people. We, we, we pay less than worldly people, but we keep Sabbath. God does not like that. God is against that. The Bible talks about justice. He said justice must, must roll. The church of God needs to repent. When you look at the judgment that came down, why they had to go into captivity for 70 years. And I tell you what was happening. While Jeremiah was calling for reforms, the people were saying, but the temple of the Lord is here. The worship is, is restored. And Jeremiah said, go back to Shiloh. See what I did to Shiloh. They had a form of worship. We need church of God people who are compassionate and loving. We must be good neighbors. Some of us are awful neighbors. We are good attenders at feasts. But we are no help to our neighbors. That must change. And imagine Jeremiah, 40 years among a people like that. It was a lonely life. But Jeremiah had another important thing that I want to mention. Courage. He was willing to stand alone. A big problem in the church is that people are not willing to stand alone. They are following friends. Let's go to Jeremiah 14. Jeremiah. No, it's not. Jeremiah 18, 18 I have. They were plotting against Jeremiah. Come let us make plots against Jeremiah. For the law shall not perish from the priest, nor counsel from the wise. In other words, they were saying.